Hi, and welcome. I am Sarah, Family Tech, and I am going to talk about the social media and youth mental health advisory that was released from the office of the U.S. Surgeon General. So I'm going to go ahead and read through the whole thing, give you my opinions throughout, and we'll just dig right into it because I'm really excited. So let's go ahead and get that back up. Actually, I'm going to go this view. And let's talk about it. So the social media and youth mental health, this is the U.S. Surgeon General's advisory. So there's a table of contents just telling about what it is. So um, a first, like as a um, about what this advisory is, is a Surgeon General's advisory is a public statement that calls the American people's attention to an urgent public health issue and provides recommendations for how it should be addressed. Advisories are reserved for significant public health challenges that require the nation's immediate awareness and action. This advisory calls attention to the growing concerns about the effects of social media on youth mental health. It explores and describes the current evidence on the positive, positive and negative impacts of social media on children and adolescents. Some of the primary areas for mental health and well-being concerns and the scale of social media's impact. This document is not an exhaustive review, and it's actually, I've gone over it um, briefly. Like, I haven't read through it exactly the way I'm reading through it now, but um, but some of the points I saw was like, we don't have enough information about this and this, and I really like that they stated that, like, they don't have all of the data to make, like, a call one way or the other on specific things, so. That's what it says. This document is not an exhaustive review of the literature. Rather, it was developed through a substantial review of the available evidence, primarily found via electronic searches of research articles published in English and resources suggested by a wide range of subject matter experts, with priority given to but not limited to meta-analysis of and, and systematic, wow, I can't read this morning, uh, literature reviews. It also offers actionable recommendations. And we'll get, like, we'll dig really far into these recommendations because I like a lot of them. For the institutions that can shape online environments, policymakers and technology companies, as well as what parents and caregivers young people and researchers can do. So um, if you want to more details, if you want to read it yourself, go to surgeongeneral.gov uh, and you can download this PDF. It's totally free. Um, anyway, so social media and youth mental health. Social media use by youth is nearly universal. Up to 95% of youth ages 13 to 17 report using a social media platform, with more than a third saying they use social media almost constantly. So, uh, and then if you have any questions while I'm going over this, feel free to pop those in the chat uh, and I'll address those as well, but I will give you my thoughts throughout this as well. So, um, although age 13 is commonly the required minimum age used by social media platforms in the U.S., Nearly 40% of children ages 8 to 12 use social media. Can you believe that? 40% of children ages 8 to 12 use social media. These are the kids that like should not even have a social media profile because it is technically against the terms of services for them to have these profiles. So, but 40% of children ages 8 to 12 use social media. Despite this widespread use among children and adolescents, robust independent safety analysis on the impact of social media on youth have not yet been conducted. There are increasing concerns among researchers, parents, and caregivers, young people, healthcare experts, and others about the impact of social media on youth mental health. More research is needed to fully understand the impact of social media. However, the current body of evidence indicates that while social media may have benefits for some children and adolescents, there are ample indicators that social media can have a profound risk of harm 
to the mental health and well-being of children and adolescents. Now, and I don't disagree with this. Although I am for kids, not kids 8 to 12, but kids over the age of 13 using social media, stepping them through social media, um, Anna McFarlane and I, her Instagram handle is Anna is the worst. She's also responsible for the Instagram profile. Kids are the worst. Um, we are developing a, a guide to help you work with your children to understand social media and help them guide them through social media. I'll get more into that at the end of this live, um, but it will be launched tomorrow. Or no, wait, today is Friday. It launches today. Oh my gosh, Friday totally snuck up on me. It is launched. You can buy it now. Um, I, wow, Friday totally snuck up on me. For some reason, I thought today was Thursday. Um, so at, anyway, at this time, we do not yet have enough evidence to determine if social media is sufficiently safe for children and adolescents. We must acknowledge the growing body of research about potential harms increase our collective understanding of the risks associated with social media use and urgently take action to create safe and healthy digital environments that minimize harm and safeguard children's adolescents and adolescents mental health and well-being during critical stages of development so um there's a little pop out here it says up to 95 percent of youth ages 13 to 17 report using a social media platform and that they use it almost constantly. That's just pulled out from that first paragraph that we already read. So let's dig into it. The influence of social media on youth mental health is shaped by many complex factors. And I think this is where a lot of parents um, and other kind of um, people who talk about this get it wrong. They just point it to social media like this is the bad. Social media is bad. But they don't take into account all of the other factors that can contribute to social media being bad for that individual. Because there's plenty of people who are using social media in a healthy manner. So there, I love that the guide says this is shaped by many complex factors. So including, but not limited to, the amount of time children and adolescents spend on the platform. Could not agree more. You know, especially when they're learning how to use it, setting time limits is going to be critical. Making sure they're not on it late at night, also critical. So um, let's see what other factors they're taking into consideration. The type of content they consume or are otherwise exposed to. Now, this social media guy that Anna and I have launched um, talks about how you can work with your children to train the algorithm to give them appropriate content. Because um, if I look at my reels or in like my TikTok, I have dog videos, I have running videos like running influencers or um, exercise influencers, um, and a lot of like and Instagram influencer um, advice. Uh, that's like what's filled my feed because that's what I've shown interest in. I don't see inappropriate content. And if you work with your child to train the algorithm into what they are interested in, that can help them see appropriate content, limit that time for sure, but um, but that will help mitigate that. Um, so where did I leave off here? The um, otherwise exposed to the activities and interactions social media affords and the degree to which it disrupts activities that are essential for health, like sleep and physical activity. Yes, yes, yes. This is like when I skimmed through this, I was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly, I mean, I, I could be proven wrong as I read through this, but all of the advice that I would give is in this advisory and I love it. So um, I love that it says, are essential for health like sleep. I think sleep and lack thereof is really a huge contributing factor to the mental health of our teens. Um, so yeah, when it interrupts sleep, so you got to just make sure you have parental controls in place that will make sure they get appropriate sleep um, and physical activity. Could not agree more. 
Uh, importantly, different children and adolescents are affected by social media in different ways based on their individual strengths and vulnerabilities and based on cultural, historical, and socioeconomic factors. There is a broad agreement among the scientific community that social media has the potential to both benefit and harm children and adolescents. And isn't that the case with anything? I mean, if you consume too much sugar or too much caffeine, yeah, that's not going to be a benefit to you. But, you know, the occasional treat is something that I like to enjoy. And you can also consider social media like a treat. Actually, Kristen Duke just recently said the same thing in a reel, that it's kind of like um, like a treat. And so you're not going to consume all treats. You want to limit the treat consumption and then um, m- make sure you can still get the benefits of social media because there are benefits. So um, brain development, excuse me, brain development is a critical factor to consider when assessing the risk for harm. Adolescents ages 10 to 19 are undergoing a highly sensitive period of brain development. This is a period when risk-taking behaviors reach their peak, when well-being experiences and greatest fluctuations, and when mental health challenges such as depression typically emerge. So um, I say this all the time, like, have you met kids um, because they don't always do the things that they know they should um, or they're just not thinking far in advance about the consequences of their actions. So this literally just happened this week in the city that I live in. Some kids were up in the mountain um, because I live near very large mountains, up in the mountains and um and had a bunch of gasoline and lit it on fire. Who knows why? Because kids, you know, don't have the fully developed brain. So they lit this big thing of gasoline and ball, like a big, huge fireball came back. Um, all three of these teenage boys have suffered severe um, burns and are currently in the hospital. But like, this is exactly what this is talking about. Adolescents ages 10 to 19 are undergoing a highly sensitive period of brain development. Yes, their brain is not fully developed. Um, And you've got to help them when their brain isn't ready to handle or ready to understand the consequences of their actions. Um, So this is a period, oh, I already said that. Furthermore, in early adolescence, when identities and sense of self are forming, brain development is especially susceptible to social pressures, peer opinions, and peer comparison. Frequent social media use may be associated with distinct changes in developing in the developing brain in the amygdala. Um, <laughs> that just makes me think of uh, Waterboy, the amygdala. Anyway, I'm a movie quote. Like anything will remind me of a movie quote. Um, important for emotional learning and behavior and the prefrontal frontal cortex. Um, a lot of really important brain words um, and that I can't see. I'm going to look this way for a second because I've covered it with myself. Um, or actually here, let me just switch this really quick and we can see that. There we go. Um, uh, yeah, developing an amygdala could in... Uh, where was I? Oh, yeah. The prefrontal cortex, important for impulse control, emotional regulation, and moderating social behavior, and could increase sensitivity to social rewards and punishments. As such, adolescents may experience heightened emotional sensitivity to the communi- communicative and interactive nature of social media. Excuse me. Adolescent social media use is predictive of a subsequent decrease in life satisfaction for certain developmental stages, including for girls 11 to 13 years old and boys 14 to 15 year olds because adolescence, sorry, I have to like look around my phone, Uh, because adolescence is a vulnerable period of brain development, social media exposure during this period warrants additional scrutiny. I could not agree more. So 
in the beginning, when they get their social media at age 13, again, I don't agree with um, people getting social media accounts before they are 13, if that's the, the terms of services. Um, Facebook Messenger Kids is a little different because that is able to um, have younger than 13, but almost all of the other social media platforms require them to be 13. I would definitely recommend waiting until 13 for all of that. Um, and then at 13 and 15, 13 and 14 is when you really need to monitor them very significantly um, while they're learning how to use social media. So uh, the potential benefits of social media use among children and ad adolescents. I love that they included this. Um, so let's talk about this. So social media can provide benefits for some youth by providing positive community and connection with others who share identities, abilities, and interests. It can provide access to important information and create a space for self-expression. So my daughter has very niche interests and she doesn't usually find a lot of people around um, uh, like actual people that have the same interests. So she does love to follow different social media accounts that have these same really niche interests. And it allows her to have, um, you know, that ability to um, create a space for expression and um, to share these interests. And I do the same thing. I love going on Reddit if I'm like watching Ted Lasso and I just, that was the last thing I watched. Um, and I go on Reddit to talk to other people about the latest Ted Lasso episode. I love doing that. So I think that's something that, you know, you can understand that as an adult, you love to talk to around the water cooler to people who have these same interests. And this is also interesting and beneficial for kids to do as well. Uh, these relate uh, back to the thing. Uh, these relationships can afford opportunities to have positive interactions with more diverse peer groups than are available to them offline and can provide important social support to youth. The buffering effects against stress that online social support from peers may provide can be especially important for youth who are often marginalized, including racial, ethnic, and uh, sexual and gender minorities. For example, studies have shown that social media may support the mental health and well being of lesbian, gay, bisexual, asexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and other youths by enabling peer connection, identity development and management, and social support. Seven out of 10 adolescent girls of color report encountering positive or identity affirming content related to race across social media platforms. That's a very interesting um, concept to think about because um, and especially in an area. So I live in Utah and, you know, unfortunately, we are not a very diverse area. And so I can see a, you know, a girl of color wanting to find more people that are like her to communicate with or to follow um, and how social media can really help with that. Um, a majority of adolescents report that social media helps them feel more accepted. And this is 58%. Like they have people who can support them through times, 67%. Like they have a place to show their creative side, 71%. Um, excuse me. And more connected to what's going on in their friends' lives, 80%. In addition, research suggests that social media-based and other digitally-based mental health interventions may also be helpful for some children and adolescents by promoting help-seeking behaviors and serving as a gateway to initiating mental health care. Now, so those are the benefits. I'm not saying that everything about social media is all sun and roses. This is the potential harms of social media use among children and adolescents. Um, so this is this is also an important part. Over the last decade, evidence, and again, I gotta like, whoop, maybe I'll just do that. Okay, uh, evidence over the last decade, evidence has emerged 
identifying reasons for concern about the potential negative impact of social media on children and adolescents. A longitudinal, wow, that's a word, a longitudinal cohort study of U.S. adolescents aged 12 to 15, um, and this is saying, I think the, um, the research group was um, 6,595, I think that's what that means, that adjusted for baseline mental health status found that adolescents who spent more than three hours a day, more than three hours a day on social media faced double the risk of experiencing poor mental health outcomes, including symptoms of depression and anxiety. So that's saying three hours a day, excuse me, three, uh, my dog is freaking out, three hours a day on social media over that is what's really damaging. It's not saying that, um, let, you know, if you limit their time to like one hour a day, it's going to go a long way um, towards helping them out. Um, as of, let me just make sure I'm still in the right spot. Okay. As of 2021, eighth and 10th graders now spend an average of three and a half hours per day on social media. In a unique natural experiment that leveraged the staggered introduction of social media platform across U.S. colleges, the rollout of the platform was associated with an increase in depression, 9% over baseline, and anxiety, 12% over baseline among college-age students. And this was a group of 359,827. The study's co-author, oh, and there's my dog. See, told you she was freaking out. <laughs> Hi, Millie. Um, the study's co-author also noted that when applied across the entirety of the U.S. college population, the introduction of social media platform may have contributed to more than 300,000 new cases of depression. If such sizable effects occurred in college-aged youth, these findings raise serious concern about the risk of harm from social media exposure for children and adolescents who are at a mo more vulnerable stage of brain development. Limits on the use of social media have resulted in mental health benefits for young, adult, young adults and adults. A small randomized controlled trial in college-aged youth found that limiting um, social media use to 30 minutes daily over three weeks led to significant improvements in depression severity. So Clearly, it's not the social media application that is increasing it. It's the amount of time they're spending on the social media application. Because as they reduce the use to 30 minutes a day, it's improving this depression severity. So this effect was particularly large for those with high baseline levels of depression who saw an improvement in depression scores by more than 35%. Another randomized controlled trial among young adults and adults found that deactivation of social media platform for four weeks improved subjects' well-being and self-reported happiness, life satisfaction, depression, and anxiety by about 25 to 40 percent. So honestly, 35 percent for the reducing it to 30 minutes a day, 25 to 40 percent for cutting it out altogether. It's almost the same. Um, uh, like self-help therapy, group therapy, and individual therapy. In addition to these recent studies, cor correlational research on associations between social media, between social media and social media use and mental health has indicated reason for concern and further investigation. These studies point to a higher relative concern of harm in adolescent girls and those already experiencing poor mental health, as well as particular health outcomes like cyberbullying, related depression, body image, and disorders, disordered eating behaviors and poor sleep quality linked to social media use. For example, a study conducted among 14-year-olds, and this study is about 11,000 people, found that greater social media use predicted poor sleep, online harassment, poor body image, low self-esteem, and higher depressive symptom scores with larger association for girls than boys. A majority of parents of adolescents say they are somewhat 
or very or extremely worried that their child's use of social media could lead to problems with anxiety, depression, lower self-esteem, being harassed or bullied, uh, feeling pressured to act certain ways and exposure to explicit content. Um, the worry about exposure to explicit content is far and above the other ones. So 71%, the other ones were um, in the 50% range. So next page. Scientific evidence suggests that harmful content exposure as well as excessive and problematic social media use are the primary areas for concern. And I completely agree. So harmful content exposure and excessive use. Um, extreme, so then potential risk of harm from content exposure. Extreme, inappropriate, and harmful content continues to be easily and widely accessible by children and adolescents. This can be spread through direct pushes, unwanted content exchanges, and algorithmic designs. In certain tragic cases, childhood deaths have been linked to um, self-harm related content and risk-taking challenges on social media platforms. This content may be especially risky for children and adolescents who are already experiencing mental health difficulties. Despite social media providing a sense of community for some, a systematic review of more than two dozen studies found that some social media platforms show live depictions of self-harm acts like um, some things I'm not going to say so I don't get demonetized. Um, and showing this content co further, these studies have shown that discussing or showing this content can normalize such behaviors, including through the formation of suicide, uh, <coughs> of self-harm models for others to follow. Sorry. Um, didn't want to get my demonetized for saying the S word. Um, so social media may also perpetrate body dissatisfaction, disordered eating behaviors, social comparison, low self-esteem, and especially among adolescent girls. Again, so this is why training the algorithm with your child when they first get social media is so important and helping them see how to continue to train the algorithm so that they are not seeing any of the content that they shouldn't be exposed to and the harm from content exposure, but that they're only seeing content that um, is going to uplift and um, and help give them a sense of community. So social media may also um, perpetrate body dissatisfaction. Dis oh, I already said that. A synthesis of 20 studies demonstrated in sig a significant relationship between social media use and body image concerns and eating disorders with social comparison as a potential contributing factor. Social comparison driven by social media is associated with body dissatisfaction, disordered eating, and depressive symptoms. And honestly, as adults, we can see that too. So if I am seeing these, you know, fitness influencers who have great bodies, I can be like, oh man, like I need to do more to, you know, to work out better, do things like that. So as an adult, I can even see that happening. So it's really important if there is content, like, and we need to talk to our kids about this, right? If there is content that is making them feel bad about themselves, they need to have the, um, the, the wherewithal? What am I trying to say? They need to have the um, ability to unfollow those people or to um, say that they don't want to see any more of that type of content so that the algorithm gets trained and they're not seeing things that is going to make them feel bad about themselves. I think that's a really important place to get to where kids are able to say, okay, I don't want to see this type of content and, um, and it's making me feel bad about myself. So I need to move on from that. So they really need to understand how their brain works and, um, and have like feel empowered enough to unfollow those people. Even if it's a friend of theirs, if it's a friend of theirs that makes them feel bad about themselves, um, through no fault of the friend, then they just unfollow them. And if, you know, down the road, a friend is like, oh, you're not following me. Oh, I don't know how that happened. Or I was just cleaning up my stuff. You know, there's a bazillion excuses they can make. But if there's somebody that is making them feel bad about themselves, then they need to understand that just unfollow that person and continue on. So when asked, uh, back to the, um, back to the advisory, 
When asked about the impact of social media on their body image, nearly half, 46% of adolescents aged 13 to 17, said social media makes them feel worse. And I agree with that. 40% says it makes them feel neither better nor worse. And only 14% said it makes them feel better. So again, it's all about who you're following as to like what's going to make you feel bad about yourself. Additionally, roughly two-thirds 64% of adolescents are often or sometimes exposed to hate-based content. Among adolescent girls of color, one-third or more report exposure to content or language on social media platforms um, that are hate-based. Oh, over here at least monthly. In a review of 36 studies, a consistent relationship was found between cyberbullying via social media and depression among children and adolescents. With adolescent females um, and sexual minority youth more likely to report experiencing incidents of cyberbullying, nearly 75% of adolescents say social media sites are only doing a fair to poor job of addressing online harassment and cyberbullying. In addition, social media platforms can be sites for predatory behaviors and interactions with malicious actors who target children and adolescents. So, so true. Um, like I said, if you have not seen the video from um, Bark about, um, it's not Childhood 2.0, but it's um, like go to Bark's uh, YouTube page and look up the um, like 35-year-old poses as an 11 year old or something. Um, it is so eye opening to the fact that, um, that this is happening, that, um, children are being targeted on social media platforms. Um, so uh, adults seeking to exploit children to financially extort them through threat or actual distribution of intimate images or to sell illicitly manufactured fentanyl. Um, adolescent girls and transgender youth are disproportionately impacted by online harassment and abuse, which is associated with negative emotional impacts. Um, nearly six in 10 adolescent girls say they've been contacted by a stranger on social media platforms in ways that make them feel uncomfortable. I'm going to say that number is probably higher than six in 10. Um, like I said, if you have not seen that video from um, Bark's YouTube page, go check it out because it is so eye opening. She like, you know, she's a 35 year old mom. I mean, I'm 44, but, um, she like makes herself look like a 13 year old, then an 11 year old and sees how quickly the predators start messaging her. And it's literally like one minute after the profile goes live. Honestly, it's insane. So, um, so it's definitely uh, a really good video to watch. Definitely check that out. Um, so excessive and problematic use of social media can um, can harm children and adolescents by disrupting important healthy behaviors. Again, this is like this is the soapbox that I will not get off of. Kids need sleep. Make sure they're not on their devices during the night. Um, social media platforms are often designed to maximize user engagement, which has the potential to encourage excessive use and behavioral dysregulation. Push notifications, autoplay, infinite scroll, quantifying and displaying popularity like likes, um, and algorithms that leverage user data to serve content recommendations are some examples of these features that maximize engagement. Um, Oh, so we do have a question. Um, where do you see that video? Um, if you go to YouTube and look at Bark, the um, Bark's uh, YouTube channel, then um, uh, it's going to be one of the most popular videos. Their most popular video is probably Childhood 2.0, which is a documentary about um, about kind of a lot of this. It's actually a really good video as well. I have a reaction video to that video on my playlist, but um, but this video is um really like i said it's it, i think it's titled something like 35 i will um i will put the 
because I'm streaming on YouTube as well. I will put the link to the video in the description of this one. But like I said, just go to Bark's um, YouTube page. It's going to be one of the most popular ones. So if you sort their videos by like popular, it should show up really quickly. But um, but yeah, it's like 35 year old. I think it says 35 year old um, poses as an 11 year old. It's so fascinating. Okay. Um, so let's go back. Oh, um, so we're talking about the algorithm now, especially like TikTok's algorithm is very good. It's probably the best in the industry. Um, so that's why time limits are so important because a lot of times you can get sucked into social media, not just, not just the kids yourself too. So putting time limits on with parental controls is going to be so important to help dissuade that, like getting sucked in and spending too much time on it. Um, I do want to mention something about displaying popularity. So when I was a kid, you know, you kind of knew who the popular kids were, right? Um, this this is the group of popular kids. Well, now they have like quantifiable data about who the popular kids are. Um, so like this person got, you know, 20 likes on their photo today. And this person got like 150 likes on their photo today. So who's more popular? Like they have this like quantifiable data these days. Um, and that's just so hard, um, on kids. So I totally understand that. So some platforms have done, um, stuff to kind of mitigate that. So like on Instagram, you can hide how many likes you have and things. So it, they're doing things to kind of help um, with that like popularity. Um, but even Snapchat with the streaks. So kids are so concerned about their streaks because they think that the longer my streak is with this person, the closer my relationship is with them. So like, oh, I have a streak of 500 days with this person. And so like, we're like best friends, but my streak with this person is only like five days. So like we just met or, you know, or we're just acquaintances. So they have this like, you know, quantifiable relationship status. Um, and so that's something I think that is harmful. Um, and especially with the streaks thing, they are so concerned about keeping their streaks alive that they will literally um, uh, like give their password to a friend if they get grounded from their phone or something like that, give the password to their friend and um, so that they can keep their streaks alive. Again, this sets a huge, terrible precedent because um, you shouldn't give your password to somebody else. They can get in and like, you know, do things and, and, you know, be inappropriate or whatever on your account. So, um, so definitely don't give your, don't let your kids give their password to other people. Um, if they want to keep their streak alive, you know, that's something that's important to them. So allow them to sign into Snapchat on your phone if they're grounded. Like say they're grounded from Snapchat or grounded from their phone. Allow them to log in on your phone just to like keep their streak alive. Um, because again, that is really, really important to them. Not to say it's not dumb, which I think it is, but it's something that's important to them and acknowledging that importance to them, um, I think is going to go a really long way to building that relationship and, um, and having that trust. So, um, so according to one recent model, nearly a third, 31% of social media use may be attributable to self-control challenges magnified by habit formation. Further, some reach, I don't even understand what that sentence means. Um, further, some researchers believe that social media exposure can overstimulate the reward center in the brain and when stimulation becomes excessive can trigger pathways comparable to addiction. S um, small studies have shown that, that people with frequent and problematic social media use can experience changes in the brain structure similar to changes seen in individual with substance or gambling addiction. In a nationally represented survey of girls 11 to 15, one third or more say they feel addicted to a social media platform. Over half of teenagers report it would be hard to give up social media. Um, nearly three in four teenagers believe that technology companies manipulate users to spend more time on their devices. In addition, According to a survey of 8th and 10th graders, the average time spent on social media is three and a half hours per day, which they've already stated. One in four spend five hours per day 
And one in seven spend seven hours per day on social media. I mean, that is so long, so long. Um, I mean, and granted, if I'm binging a TV show, you know, seven hours can go by really, really fast. <laughs> um, but seriously, that is so much time spent, you know, setting these time limits through parental controls is so, so important. And back to their point about it being kind of um, akin to um, to drugs or um, I, I, and this might have been in um, either Childhood 2.0 or The Social Dilemma, that the, um, the act of refreshing your feed when you pull down and it refreshes, you pull down and it refreshes is similar to doing the, um, a slot machine, you know, so you pull down the thing, it goes and like, so it's like gambling and you pull down your feed is, you know, gives you that rush. Is there going to be something new for me now? And that's like a gambling addiction. And it's totally true. So that's why um, fight the new drug is a great um, resource, um, especially with a pornography addiction. Um, fight the new drug is doing amazing work, but they, um, have a lot of research about pornography being similar um, to the brain as um, actual, you know, drugs. So definitely check that out. I'm going to take another drink. All right. <clears throat> We're 10 pages in. I think there's 25 pages, but these other pages get um, get really specific on like what should be done. Anyway. Excessive and problematic social media use, such as compulsive or uncontrollable use, has been linked to sleep problems. Again, make sure they're not on it while they're sleeping. Attention problems and feelings of exclusion among adolescents. So, <laughs> so, kids are out for the summer. Um, a systematic review. Uh, sleep is essential for the healthy development of adolescents. Could not agree more. A systematic review of 42 studies on the effects of social, excessive social media use found a consistent relationship between social media use and poor sleep quality. Let's like preach this from the like from the rooftops. Uh, agree 100. percent Um, and uh, is it, oh yeah. The consistent relationship between social and poor sleep quality, reduced sleep duration, sleep difficulties, and depression among youth. Poor sleep has been linked to altered neurological development in adolescent brains, depressive symptoms, and, and, <clears throat> and thoughts and behaviors of self-harm. On a typical weekday, nearly one in three adolescents report using social media until midnight or later, while screen media use encompasses various digital activities, social media applications are the most commonly used applications by adolescents. So one in three adolescents are using their screens, using social media until midnight or later. Now, if you've never, if you've never had a baby, <laughs> then you might not, or like had an infant at home, you might not understand how important sleep is. But I will say, when my son was a newborn, there was a very distinct day. And he actually, my daughter, like, never slept. Um, she has ADHD now, so I, like, I get where, like, she just couldn't turn off her brain. Like, we understand that now because she has a diagnosis. But my son was able to sleep really well right away. But it was, like, still a few weeks, right? And the day that he slept all night, I remember that next day going, Oh my gosh, like my brain can function again. I can think, I can do things because I got enough sleep last night. And it was so eye opening because I'm like, oh my gosh, sleep is so, so important to your brain because without it, I like, you can't think. And I can understand how. Um, and this is actually, um, I talked about this with, um, with somebody, one of my lives that, um, sleep was, um, like depriving people of sleep is something that people use in brainwashing. If they're trying to brainwash a victim, they will 
deny them sleep because their thinking and their like cognitive cognitive reasoning is so diminished when they have a lack of sleep. Um, so anyway, just so eye opening. I could not preach getting enough sleep more. Um, so in recent in a recent narrative review of multiple studies, problematic social media use has also been linked to both self-reported and diagnosed attention deficit hyper ADHD. I just talked about ADHD, my daughter. Um, although more research is necessary to understand whether one causes the other, a longitudinal prospective study of adolescents without ADHD symptoms at the beginning of the study found that over... Uh, over a two-year follow-up, high-frequency use of digital media with social media as one of the most common activities was associated with a modest yet st statistically significant increased odds of developing ADHD symptoms. Now, like I said, I like had I known what I know now, um, my daughter always had ADHD. I'm not blaming it on any of like the screens or anything because even with her in like when she was in my stomach. I didn't have to do kick counts. Like, so when you're pregnant, you are supposed to like count how many times they like, you know, as long as they're kicking at least like 10 times a day, then, you know, you have a healthy baby. Never had to do it because she was constantly in motion in my stomach, just constantly in motion. And then, like I said, as an infant, like she never slept through the night. Um, so like these were all signs like, oh, there's something... <laughs> different about her. Um, cause like my son, same kind of technology use does not have any of these symptoms. So, um, definitely could see that even like in utero. Um, but I could see this being, um, being a factor. Additionally, social media induced fear of missing out and the pervasive apprehension that others might be having a rewarding experience from which one is absent has been associated with depression, anxiety, and um, neuroticism. Um, and I can see that, like I said, you know, you see your friends all out together and you weren't invited. Yeah, that sucks. And it's sad. Um, and that can definitely be a factor. So, uh, nearly every teenager in America uses social media and yet we do not have enough evidence to conclude that it is sufficiently safe for them. Our children have become unknowing participants in a decades long experiment. It is critical that independent researchers and technology companies work together to rapidly advance our understanding of the impact of social media on children and adolescents. This section describes the known gaps and proposes additional areas for research that warrant urgent consideration. So um, I'm not, I'm going to kind of skip through this quickly just because this is where it's saying, hey, we don't have enough data. Um, and like, while that's important, just know that like, there's just not enough data yet. Um, so how do in-person versus digital social interactions differ in terms of impact on health? What are potential pathways through which social media can may cause harm? What type of content at what frequency and intensity generates the most harm? Um, through which modes, like the computer or whatever, like this is all just stuff we don't know. What are the beneficial effects of social media? Um, who benefits the most in um, what individual company? So societal level factors may protect youth from negative effects. Um, how does social media use interact with a person's developmental stage for measuring risk? So like, this is just all stuff that we don't know enough about. Let's do some more research. Um, and I love that they stated that because that, um, that tweet that kind of had me a little angry, um, there's so much data missing from that study where you can't make a conclusion like, you know, all devices, you know, gone until high school, you can't make that conclusion because you don't have all of the variables or all of the factors to include in that. So we must take action. So here's the action part. Um, our children and adolescents don't have the luxury of waiting years until we know the full extent of social media's impact. Their childhoods and development are happening now. While social media use can have a positive impact for some children, the evidence noted throughout this Surgeon General's advisory necessitates significant concern with the way it's currently designed, deployed, and utilized. Child and adolescent use of platforms designed for adults 
places them at high risk of unsupervised, developmentally inappropriate, and potentially harmful use, according to the National Scientific Study Scientific Council on Adolescents. At a moment when we are experiencing a national youth mental health crisis, now is the time to act swiftly and decisively to protect children and adolescents from risk of harm. To date, the burden of protecting youth has fallen predominantly on children, adolescents, and their families. Parents face significant challenges in managing children and adolescents' youth of social media applications, and youth are using social media at increasingly earlier ages. Nearly 70% of parents say parenting is now more difficult than it was 20 years ago, with technology and social media as the top two cited reasons. While nearly all parents believe they have responsibility to protect their children from inappropriate content online, the entire burden of mitigating the risk of harm of social media cannot be placed on the shoulders of children and parents. Nearly 80% of parents believe technology companies have a responsibility to protect children from inappropriate content as well. And I agree with this. Like I said, you cannot place the burden completely on the technology companies. There are parenting things that you can do to make sure to mitigate these harms for your children. While it might be difficult, it might take some time out of your day. It's important time. I say this all the time. If you discover that your child is um, diagnosed with a disease, you would research the heck out of that disease so you can better protect their health and, um, and help them have, you know, a functional life. And, they're, and we're not doing this for technology. You need to get involved, get researching, and know what it is you're handing over to your kid. So um, we must provide children and their families with the information and tools. Oh, so like I said, like with all this government regulation stuff that's coming out, um, I don't think it's up to the government to protect my children. It's up to us to protect our children. Um, we must provide children and their families with the information tool to navigate the changing digital environment. But this burden to support our children must be further shared. There are actions technology companies can take to make their platforms safer for children and adolescents. I agree with that. Um, I don't think they should be forced to, but I agree that there is a lot that they can do to help us. Um, there are actions researchers can take to develop the necessary research base to support further safeguards, and there is a role for local, state, and federal policy to implement protections for our children and adolescents. The U.S. has a strong history of taking action in such circumstances in the case of toys, transportation, medications, among other sectors that have widespread adoption and impact on children. The U.S. has often adopted a safety-first approach to mitigate the risk of harm to consumers according to this principle. A basic threshold for safety must be met. And until safety is de demonstrated with rigorous evidence and independent evaluation, protections are put in place to minimize the risk of harm from products, services, or goods. For example, the Consumer Protect Product Safety Commission requires toy manufacturers to undergo third-party testing and be certified through Children's Product Certificate as compliant with the federal toy safety standard for toys intended for use by children. To reduce the risk of injury from motor vehicle accidents, the National Highway Traffic Safety Mission requires manufacturers to fit new motor vehicles with standard airbags and seatbelts. Among other safety features and conduct, crash tests must be to be compliant with the federal motor safety standards. And I always compare parental controls to seatbelts. So, you know, I always say that it's not because I don't trust you, child. Um, it's because uh, I, I'm not putting parental controls on because I don't trust you. And it's not that the government requires seatbelts because they don't trust us to stay in our seat. They don't, it's not to like keep us in our seat all the time. It is to protect us when things go wrong. To better safeguard the mental health and well-being of children and adolescents, policymakers, technology companies, researchers, families, and young people must all engage in a proactive, multifaceted approach through the recommendations below. We can provide more resources and tools to children and families. I totally agree. 
um, we can gain a better understanding of the full impact of social media, and we can maximize the benefits and minimize the harms of social media platforms to create a far safer and healthier environments for children. So what policymakers can do, uh, I'm, and I'm going to go like, because this is really for the policymakers, and I agree with it, but like, this is the government part. I will really focus on what the parents and the adolescents can do. Um, so we're just going to skim through this one. Strengthen protections to ensure greater safety for children interacting with all social media platforms. Develop age-appropriate health and safety standards for technology platforms. Require a higher standard of data privacy for children to protect them from potential harms like exploitation and abuse. Pursue policies that further limit access in ways that minimize risk of harm. Ensure technology companies share data relevant to health impacts of their platforms in a manner that is, uh, and then support the development and implementation of a, and evaluation of digital and media literacy curriculum in schools. I agree. Support increased funding for future research. Engage with international partners working to protect children. So um, that's what policymakers can do. What technology companies can do, again, we're going to skim through this one a little, um, conduct and facilitate trans transparent, independent assessments of the impact of social media, kind of what they said the go government can do, be transparent and share assessment findings. They also said that in the government section, assess the potential risk of online interactions and take steps, active steps to prevent potential misuse. Yes. Um, establish scientific advisory committee to inform approaches and policies aimed at creating safe environments for children. Prioritize user health and safety in the design and development of social media products and services. Design, develop, and evaluate platforms, products, and tools that foster safe and healthy environments for youth. Share data relevant to time if effective to adjudicate. Oh. Sorry. Um, request a complaint from young people, families, educators, and others to address online abuse and harmful content. Totally agree. Okay. Now, what parents and caregivers can do? This is the meat of the thing. So we're going to read all through this. The onus of mitigating and the potential harms of social media should not be placed solely on the shoulders of parents and caregivers. There are steps they can take to help protect and support children and adolescents against the risk of harm. Create a family media plan. Um, if you haven't gotten my family media, like my contract, um, definitely type contract in the, um, in the comments and I will get that sent over to you. So um, agreed upon expectations can help establish healthy technology boundaries at home, including social media use. A family media plan can promote open family discussion and rules about media use and include topics such as balancing screen and online screen, online time and content boundaries and not disclosing personal information. For more information, creating family media plan, there's one that they can use. You can use there as well. Um, and, it, and, and Marie, you might need to, um, message me content, like do a direct message, uh, if you're on Instagram, because these, um, the chat actually goes away. So I won't be able to see this after this. So if you do want the contract and you're on, um, Instagram, direct message me, just contract and, and we'll get that handled for you. Uh, create tech-free zones and encourage children to foster in-person friendships. Since electronics can be a potential distraction after bedtime and can interfere with sleep, consider restricting the use of phones, tablets, and computers for at least one hour before bedtime and through the night. Uh, agree. Consider keeping family meal times and in-person gatherings device-free to build social bonds and engage in two-way conversation. Help your child develop social skills and nurture his or her in-person relationships by encouraging unstructured and offline connections with others, making unplugged interactions a daily priority. Um, Next, model responsible social media behavior. As children often learn behaviors and habits from the behavior, from what they see around them, try to model the behavior you want to see. 
set parental controls on your own devices. Um, Parents can set a good example of what responsible and healthy social media use looks like by limiting their own use. And this is actually part of my contract as well. Being mindful of social media habits, including when and how parents share information or content about their child and modeling positive behavior on your social media accounts. Um, I love that they included this because something about that is also super important that um, getting your kids permission to have them on your social media platform is very important. When they're babies, definitely try and make those private, but um, they want to be the owners of their digital footprint. And when you kind of take that away from them, um, it it's hard. So make sure you get their consent if you're going to post a picture about them. Say like they're graduating high school, you wanna post a picture, hey, do you mind if I post this on my social media profile? So very important. Anyway. Uh, teach kids about technology and empower them to be responsible online participants at the appropriate age. Ah, like, can I just woo woo on this one? Um, I just did a reel about this. Totally agree. So discuss with children the benefits and risks of social media, as well as the importance of respecting privacy and protecting personal information in age appropriate ways. Have conversations with children about who they are connecting with, their privacy settings, their online experiences, and how they are spending their time online. Empower and encourage them to seek help when they should need it. Learn more about the benefits of risk, and then there's some resources also. Like I said, I will send. I will put a link to directly to the PDF um, in the comments um, on YouTube. Um, Report cyberbullying and online abuse and exploitation. Talk to your child about their reporting options and provide support without judgment if he or she tells or shows you that they are being harassed through email, text messages, online games, social media. Um, we'll see if this goes, have been contacted by an adult seeking private images or asking them to perform intimate acts. You or your child can report cyberbullying um, to the online platform or your local law enforcement. Um, I would also say, um, in addition to this, um, you know, talk to your child about reporting options and provide support without judgment. Also do this if they tell you they have been looking at inappropriate content. No judgment. Okay, thank you. Like, let's address that. Um, and I'm sorry that um, that you saw that. I'm sorry that um, that this is out there for you to see, but make sure if they're coming to you to talk to you about this, um, make sure it's without judgment and you guys can work through it together. Um, work with other parents to help establish shared norms and practices and to support programs and policies around healthy social media use. Such norms and practices among parents facilitate collective action and can make it easier to set and implement boundaries on social media use for children. Okay, so this is what parents can do. Now, what can children do? The burden of mitigating the potential harms of social media does not rely rests solely on the shoulders of children and adolescents, but there are measures they can take. So one, reach out for help. If you or someone you know is being negatively affected by social media, reach out to a trusted friend or adult for help. If you or someone you know is experiencing a mental health crisis, contact um, these lifelines. There's some resources in the PDF. Create boundaries to help balance online and offline activities. Limit the use of phones, tablets, and computers for, to, for at least one hour before bedtime and through the night to enable sufficient quality sleep. Again, I could not say this more. Keep mealtimes and in-person gatherings device-free to help build social bonds and engage in two-way conversations with others. Nurture your in-person relationships by connecting with others and making unplugged interactions a daily priority. Develop protective strategies and healthy practices such as tracking the amount of time you spend online, blocking unwanted contacts and content, learning about and using available privacy and safety settings, learning and utilizing digital media literacy skills to help tell the difference between fact and opinion, and ensuring you are connecting with peers in person. Um, what did I want to say about that? Oh, this is where I was talking about earlier about training the algorithm and learning things. But um, 
But something they add I love is learning how to tell what's real and what's not. So, you know, going deeper instead of just a headline and looking at the sources of things. So um, I think that's a really important skill to also give your children um, to help them navigate what's real online and what's not um, and, and how to discern that for themselves. Um, be cautious about what you share. Personal information about you has value. Be selective with what you post and share online and with whom. As it is often public and can be stored permanently, if you are, aren't are sure you should, you should post something, it's usually best if you don't. Talk to a family member or a trusted adult to see if you should. Um, and again, this is actually, a lot of this is part of my contract. So definitely, if you want to check out my contract, send me a direct message. Um, I'm at Family Tech on Instagram if you're watching this on YouTube. Um, protect yourself and others. Harassment that happens in email, text messaging, direct messaging, and online games or social media is harmful and can be cyberbullying. It might involve trolling, rumors, or photos passed around for others to see, and it can leave people feeling angry, sad, ashamed, or hurt. If you or someone you know is the victim of cyberbullying or other forms of online harassment and um, abuse, don't keep online harassment ab or abuse a secret. Reach out to at least one person you trust, such as a close friend, family member, counselor, or teacher who can give you help and support you deserve. Um, visit stopbullying.gov for helpful tips on how to report cyberbullying. If you have experienced online harassment and abuse by a dating partner, contact an expert at Love is Respect for support. Or if your private images have been taken and shared online without your permission, visit Take It Down to help get them removed. Don't take part in online harassment or abuse. Avoid forwarding or sharing messages or image images to tell others and tell others to stop and other ways to report offensive content to the site or network where you saw it. Um, and then again, I'm going to skip through this. This is just what researchers can do. Um, again, a lot of um, variables that they need to um, find uh, to research and then just acknowledgements. So that is the social media advisory um, from the U.S. Surgeon General. Um, it's not often where I'm like super stoked about something that the government puts out about social media or even headlines about social media, but I basically agree with everything in this advisory. So I am really excited about it. Now, if you want to, um, I will, I have a link. I'll put it in my stories on Instagram. Uh, actually it's already in my stories on Instagram, um, to Anna McFarlane and I's um, new social media guide. It is not something where you're just going to make your kids read it. It's not something where you just read it. It's something that you do together. Um, and that's one reason the book, um, good pictures, bad pictures is so good. It's because you're sitting down with your child and you're reading this book together and you're learning. And this is what our social media guide is all, all about. So definitely check out our social media guide. Um, like I said, if you are looking at this on Instagram or on YouTube, go to my Instagram. It's family tech in my stories. There is a link. If it's on YouTube, I will just put the link in the description to this social media guide. Definitely check it out. Um, if anybody has any more questions, definitely let me know. Um, I know I kind of threw this live. I usually just go live on Thursdays with my interviews, but I wanted to go over this. Um, if you liked this, I also would... I've been meaning to go over the social media law from Utah. So maybe I'll do that next Friday. Um, I have also been meaning to go over a bunch of books. Um, I have a huge stack of books that I need to review. So um, I'm thinking about doing that live as well. So let me know in the comments if that's something you're interested in. If you like this, definitely like this video. Um, if you are not following me on Instagram, go ahead and follow me there. Um, if you're not subscribed to my YouTube channel, definitely hit that subscribe button. Um, I, like I said, love this from our government and I'm super excited um, that they are really promoting that it's not like, it's not all bad. Just teach your kids how to use it and set some ground rules. And I think we can really overcome this, social, um, this health crisis. So 
thank you for showing up and I will leave it there and we will see you guys next time.